custom moves. Some creative, some lame, some just downright broken. This was one of the most innovative features in Smash history that nobody talks about. An addition that shattered limitations and gave hope to fans who wanted more out of their favorite characters, Nintendo has swept further under the rug than Mother 3, The Virtual Boy, and that Mario Party minigame that almost got them sued for causing severe hand injuries. Oh wait, they actually brought that one back. And if your Smash experience started with Ultimate, the likely reason you may not have heard of custom moves before is because Nintendo doesn't want you to. This feature was only included in Smash for 3DS and Wii U, and was never brought back. Why? Why did Nintendo cut nearly 400 moves from Smash? A wide variety of specials you could assign to your favorite character. If someone doesn't fit your playstyle, you can make it your own. Gameplay stops being repetitive since every matchup is different. Why did it not only go, but essentially get erased from history? Buckle up, cause we're gonna experience a story of development hell. One of the most controversial tournaments ever, and the likely loss of millions of dollars on a feature they for some reason barely even promoted. Time for me to label this video under the conspiracy content section as we uncover the real reasons why custom moves will never be seen again. Custom moves started as a simple concept. Man, I wish my favorite character could use more abilities that they're known for in their home series, but we don't want to cut anything that's in their moveset right now. So what do we do? Huh. How about we just make more moves? It was a simple but genius idea, and there were so many awesome additions that came from this. You know how they just gave Luigi a green fireball because he was literally just based on Mario's moveset in the beginning, but we can't have them looking the same, so let's just, uh, change the color, even though he's never used this in any game prior to that. Well, custom moves gave us Ice Luigi. Yes, you can change Luigi's neutral special to the ice shot from when you get the ice flower in many modern Mario games. They didn't give this ability to Mario, but at least giving it to one of the brothers made Luigi different in a logical way. Not just making his fireball green. Green! <laughs> Bowser has had generic fire breath for the entirety of his Smash run, which he does use at times throughout the series, but he's much more well known for using the large individual fireball shots. In Smash 4 with custom moves, you can take your pick. Pac-Man has one called the On Fire Hydrant where it literally shoots fire instead of water. This has to be one of the best ideas in Smash, oh my. From Diddy's banana peels actually making you slip, to Wario spewing garlic breath, to Mega Man having like 50 different alternative projectiles to shoot, creativity seemed to be at the forefront and at a glance, this could have completely changed the way we think about Smash as we know it. But while the exterior shines bright, like many products out there, we only see the end result while ignoring the chaos behind the scenes. When examining the reasons for why these got cut, the obvious one has to stem from the insane amount of effort and resources they would take to create. The thing is though, making 400 additional moves had to have been seen by the development team behind Smash 4 as a difficult task right? They're experienced in the field, they knew what they were getting into, if it was gonna be a lot of work, it had to have been doable to start and ultimately finish it, so how bad could it really be? Well, judging by the reported hectic work schedule for the staff and series director Masahiro Sakurai in particular, with him suffering calcic tendinitis in his right arm due to the arduous hours being put in, it's safe to say they weren't exactly taking their time. This project had to be done, and fast. This type of work schedule isn't anything new for Smash Brothers games, with Sakurai also notoriously being hospitalized during the development of the series' second entry Melee after working for 40 hours straight with one 4-hour break to sleep. What? Hospitalized. Literally. These people are dedicated and passionate to make these games the best they can be, and with Melee only having less than 18 months for its development in contrast to Brawl having close to 3 years, one would think they would have learned their lesson. But nope. Despite Brawl releasing in 2008 and Smash 4 being announced in 2011, development of the games only began in 2012, since Sakurai was busy working on the revival of the Kid Icarus series with Uprising. They likely planned to release Smash 4 a few years after the Wii U had settled in the market, taking the world by storm just like its predecessor. They didn't need Smash that early. Oh boy, did that not age well. With the early sales for the Wii U being significantly less than expected, the reasons for which have been well documented with the notoriously poor marketing campaign and branding being regarded as the main culprits, the key factor that I don't see mentioned nearly enough is the lack of major games to play on it right out of the gate. There was New Super Mario Bros. U at launch, Nintendo Land, 
zombies? They made a big mistake here and didn't have enough to launch the console with, so if Smash was gonna come out, it'd have to come out quickly. With a similar strategy to Mario Kart 8 being put in place, the fourth entry of the Super Smash Bros. series would need to be out by 2014 to give this console a chance. It would have to be there, and with not one, but two entries committed to develop, more characters planned than in any game before, and the ambitious feature of custom moves too, it's safe to say the team had their work cut out for them. Now, developing a game to be the best it can be given your budget can be difficult when you spend your resources unwisely. While Nintendo is very tight-lipped about their game budgets and we don't know exactly how much money was given for Smash 4's development, Pokemon Sword and Shield as comparables have been reported to have gotten around 20 million for their development. These games received a ton of backlash from longtime fans for starting the trend of not including every Pokemon from the past inside. But since many would never transfer Pokemon from previous games into these ones anyway in the minds of the Pokemon company, not having them exist at all was basically the same thing. The copious amounts of time, energy, and likely millions of dollars to implement Pokemon that most players ultimately wouldn't use didn't make sense. And in the case of Smash 4, this same situation can be applied to custom moves, except for one key difference they still went through with it. I mentioned just some of the cool examples of custom moves earlier on, and yes, there truly are a bunch of really good ones, but with Smash 4 having a roster of 58 main characters with four specials each, and there now being two extra versions added for each of the specials, you're now literally creating triple the number that you normally would for two different games. This is not a small difference, guys. If you think about what the most difficult part of developing a Smash game would be, from the stages, to the assist trophies, to the items, to the PNG images, the fighters are obviously the ones with the most time invested as they should be. The main attraction for Smash is and always has been to answer the question of who will win in a fight. Mario or Link? Bowser or Ganon? Wii Fit Trainer or Byleth? Okay, maybe not that last one. But the point is, the fighters are key, and the specials being the most detailed part of the moveset now getting tripled for everyone was a massive undertaking. Now, if you don't believe me, then let's take a look at this original concept art for the game featuring Mario with four versions of his fireball special. Yeah. Four. While we ended up with three, one standard and two customs, there was originally going to be an additional one on top of that, quadrupling the workload for the team, which could have been crazy, but Sakurai said it was scrapped earlier on due to how much time some of them were taking. And you know what else seems to have been scrapped? More intricate custom specials. I listed some of my favorites, but there are many, many customs that are just, hey, what if Bowser Jr.'s Mecha Koopas were bigger? What if Game & Watch's food was bigger? What if Snake's at- oh sorry, wrong game. There are several of these attacks which just have slight speed or height variations from their default move, which is totally fine and understandable. Trust me, I don't blame them at all, but it's clear they weren't executing the idea to its full potential all the time. Luigi's Ice Ball referenced core series material while providing a unique attack to his kit to slow the opponent down. Donkey Kong having an electric punch? I mean, it's cool and all, but let's be honest, I don't think this is one that they had planned for all those years in the documents. It's clear some corners were being cut. If they indeed had that $20 million budget, we can assume hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars were planned to be dropped on giving every character four entirely different specials, but they seemed to find that with the time constraints they were under, that money and workforce would have to be applied elsewhere. Probably at everyone's favorite mode, Smash Tour, right? And while two years may seem like a while, if you weren't entirely sold on the time constraints, there were many, many interviews backing up some characters and features being the last minute additions to Smash that they genuinely didn't know would be done in time. Bowser Jr. was one of those characters on the chopping block. They barely squeezed him in but they got it done. And while Sakurai stated at the time that the reason Smash 4 never got a story mode like the subspace emissary in Brawl was because he didn't want people spoiling the cutscenes online, okay, as if this wasn't crazy enough at the time, which many people, yes, actually still believe to this day, the real reason is undoubtedly due to the development strains, and tripling the output of character specials certainly didn't help that situation very much. But even through all of this, all the hardship, the financial and physical toll they likely took, the need to cut out many unique possibilities for customs in exchange for Yoshi's um, lick doing damage, they still got them done. The feature was now in the game, so when DLC was announced in the final Smash 4 presentation and we got that shocking Mewtwo reveal, we never ended up getting custom moves for these fighters. What? So they put in all this effort to give every character custom moves, but when they finally have a bit more breathing room with DLC not being on nearly as strict of a time frame as the main game's development was, why stop now? 
While we can try to peek at the back end of Smash 4, finding hints of information about the creative process, what was front and center at the time was the material Nintendo themselves were officially promoting. We got the hype character trailers every now and again, which was such a great addition, and at E3 2014, we saw custom moves showcased to a slight degree, with the Miis and subsequently Palutena's trailers showcasing way more moves than normal. We had gotten hints of custom specials already with Mega Man's trailer, but nothing was outright stated, and it was one of those reveals which was just sorta of dropped so that eagle-eyed fans could notice and pick up on it without it being put front and center. Like, custom moves are here, hey guys, look at all these custom moves, no, it wasn't like that. There was some stuff on Twitter, and the community was definitely aware of them being a thing, don't get me wrong, but they were not as front and center as they thought they would be or deserved to be considering the strenuous effort it took to create them. It makes you wonder. Did Nintendo intentionally fail to market this feature? I know it seems ridiculous and a bit far-fetched, but hey, so did the idea of Mario and the Rabbids teaming up together in a licensed Switch game, but here we are getting sequels to it now. Nothing is too far out of the realm of possibility with this company, and I think there's some merit to this. First things first though, why would it make any sense for Nintendo to deliberately shun a core new feature for the game that they spent so much time on? Well, I think they knew two things. Number one, the feature is designed for longtime fans of the series who want something more. I've played enough of Mario with the same moveset over the years, I want a change of pace, so in Nintendo's minds, the fans who are already hardcore and into it will find out about the feature regardless. It's already a draw to them, but number two is they run the risk by making it a key selling point of the game that in any future Smash entry, they would not only be expected to do it again, but expected to improve on it again. If this had gone over really well and there would have been pleased to have specific requests for customs and they'd have to deliver if they wanted to make the fans happy, by promoting it just just enough so that people knew about it, but sort of hiding it in its own section here away from the main menu and not being predominantly featured in trailers, they save themselves from creating this new, frankly unattainable expectation in the future. If it does go over super well that their hand is forced to bring it back, they can promote the hell out of it next time and it'll seem like that much more of a big addition. But if it didn't, then it can be treated exactly like it is now. Not a cherished relic of the past, but is something that never even happened. DLC custom moves weren't a priority because they were deliberately designed not to be. And due to the reaction from the fanbase, they weren't exactly heavily requested either. But why weren't they appreciated by fans exactly? Well, yeah, they were broken. Take Super Speed, a version of Sonic Spin Dash with no startup and being cancelable mid-jump while keeping momentum in the air for one of the best characters in the game. The Kong Cyclone was platform cancelable, had super armor, and allowed for so much leeway when playing a heavy character that you don't normally get. Having problems recovering with Ganondorf? Well how about using the Wizard's Dropkick which can give him elevation in the air and then a better horizontal path. There's so many great custom moves, many of which were considered broken, but none really broke the barrier that we just have to ban this move specifically and we gotta get rid of it now. The target hadn't been set at this time, the fans were still getting acquainted with this new feature. So now the time came for the biggest fighting game tournament of the year. When EVO 2015 rolled around, despite some debate amongst the community going in, custom moves would be allowed. And it didn't exactly go well. The balance of the competitive metagame in Smash 4 had already been in question around this time. While Ultimate has seen many characters in the upper echelon of viability throughout its run, Smash 4's competitive scene at this time was mostly controlled by Sheik and Diddy Kong, who were both coincidentally present in the finals that year that happened to be given further benefits from custom moves despite them already being good. These guys didn't need the additional power, and while some busted moves for some lower tier characters provided a sense of balance, this was not evenly distributed. We had poor Zelda and Jigglypuff sitting down there at the bottom of the community tier list with little to no upgrade in this regard. But oh yeah, we gotta give some of the best moves to the already overpowered ones. <sighs> Character diversity is something that helps a lot when drawing new fans into a fighting game, but Melee has shown that a centralized metagame doesn't necessarily have to be a bad one. So even though we were seeing the same characters over and over, were the games that unwatchable? Well, you can just look at this. This was a matchup from the tournament between players Larry Lure playing Sheik and Captain Awesome as Villager, which was basically the Pokemon equivalent of Toxic Stall. Like I was saying, Sheik was one of the established top tier characters, and sometimes in a stifled metagame, you naturally want to find counters to what works, even if the option you pick isn't viable in many other situations. This was Smash 4 Villager. Using the massive projectiles in combination with the timber counter, which trips up opponents who walk over it, you were basically able to create a wall. Playing such a campy style that made the dreaded Bayonetta matches we'd end 
end up seeing years later seem like a treat. The three game set took over 20 minutes and featured two time limit draws. Kinda remind me of some other fighting show. But yeah, it wasn't too fun to watch, with a game at a separate event between Nairo and ADHD resulting in the better player being defeated from this same counterplay method. While some prominent players in the community like Mewtwo King had voiced their complaints about that villager strategy being legal and others were making complaints about similar broken strategies that were present from custom moves, the move to ban them was never fully put into place until Mewtwo was released as DLC. The fanbase took a while to get acquainted with custom moves, there was not much hype behind them and they likely didn't start working on them for the DLC because of that. But I'm sure if the competitive scene reacted differently and there was tons of uproar and support for custom moves, they would have forced Nintendo's hand to add them at a later date after the character came out. But when Mewtwo was dropped and he didn't have them, it wasn't terribly missed. And by many, actually appreciated believe it or not. Because this gave validation to everyone in the community who wanted these banned from tournaments through all this time. For all of these reasons, the broken strategies, the toxic gameplay, many lower tiers not getting a chance, now we finally had an outright excuse to remove custom moves from competitive play, since Mewtwo didn't have any. Sure Zelda's were trash, but at least she had them. Mewtwo players had a distinct disadvantage, and let me explain. Tournament organizers needed to create preset custom movesets during this time to keep the events going. You can't just have fans in the audience sitting around waiting as players build their own custom movesets every game, so with help from the community, the 10 most popular customizations for every character was usually the standard included at every major tournament. So you're giving Mewtwo right off the bat 9 less possibilities for move combinations at minimum. It wasn't just unfair, it was playing with objectively a tenth of the potential options. Which aside from specific tournaments and what became known as the official custom moveset project trying to push the community forward would end up being cut from most events, which did have some positives. With so many different possible matchups and move combinations to prepare for, many top players found themselves trying to be good at counteracting as many strategies as possible, instead of being great at playing against a few select combinations, which is a big difference. Having more centered gameplay and knowing for sure what the moves for your opponent were gonna be and studying how to play around that would be a lot easier now and allow for gameplay that was less like this, and more like this except they'll Bayonetta game. But for all the good that indeed came from this, the amount of bad that spawned from this one decision to not give Mewtwo custom moves, I feel significantly outweighs any positives. And it may have been the real nail in the coffin for why we never saw any of these moves again. Or maybe it wasn't, since there's evidence custom moves may actually have been planned to be brought back for Smash Ultimate. Believe it or not, there is some proof to back this theory up, but whether they were planned to be an ultimate or not, there were undoubtedly many moves given to fighters in the game that are very similar or even outright inspired by Smash 4 custom moves. Link's giant bomb in Smash 4 has a very similar mechanic to the Breath of the Wild bombs they gave him in Ultimate. While you can't choose to detonate them at any time this time around, the concept of a larger bomb which didn't explode on impact was actually introduced here, four years before Ultimate and almost three before Breath of the Wild itself. So crazy. Toon Link had a version of the Fire Arrow calling back to Young Link's special attack since he wasn't in Smash 4, only to be brought back for Ultimate. I guess this completely made up for cutting him at the time, right? Now Ganondorf finally getting his sword back in Ultimate was a really big deal, a much more fitting move for him in separating him further away from his origins as a Captain Falcon clone, which still made no sense by the way. But what if I told you that Ultimate isn't technically the first time that Ganon drew his blade? Yup, in Smash 4 one of Ganon's custom moves is called Warlock Blade as a substitute for the punch where in a very similar vein to the Fire Emblem Swordsman, he strikes the opponents with it. It even has a tipper. Judging by how little attention this got, it just shows how underutilized and underpromoted this feature was. But hey, at least it teased new content for Ultimate, I guess? While Wolf wasn't in Smash 4, his side special Wolf Flash, which is more of an angled version of the attack with an upward trajectory, is actually a custom move for Fox, which is really cool. Kinda surprising though that this was the case for Toon and Young Link as well, when neither Wolf or Young Link would end up joining the roster as DLC. The animation was already made, you'd think it would be easier to create than some of the other cut characters that they ended up bringing back, just like how Ness had Lucas's version of PK Fire before they brought him back as DLC, but hey, at least we got everyone back for Ultimate. Well, without their custom moves. Without a doubt, one of the biggest indicators for custom move carryover into Smash Ultimate is with Palutena, as if you didn't know, her counterattack in this game serves to defend based on whether the attack is reflectable or not, either being the standard looking counter or the reflect barrier. Yet in Smash 4, these were in two separate slots, both the side and down specials respectively. So was her now iconic explosive flame attack not in Smash 4 then? Well, you'd think, but no, it actually was, just as a custom move. Hidden away in the neutral special section were three options for this one attack. 
with none being based on one another. Entirely original moves being the shots from the staff, explosive flame, and another called Heavenly Light which never got brought back. They made an already incredibly unique character even more unique than many initially realized here. An explosive flame in the eyes of the Smash Ultimate development team was so necessary to include in the main moveset that they just had to upgrade it. We all love that decision, right? This could all lead one to the conclusion that these were planned to be an ultimate at least at one point, which they are proven to have prepared for since data was still left in the code for ultimate with all the values for additional specials just being zeroed out. One theory that could support the idea of DLC custom moves to fill the slots they made is the smaller selection of new characters added into the base roster of Ultimate. While we obviously don't look at Ultimate's final roster as being small by any stretch of the imagination, it may never be this large again, but at launch, they introduced less characters than any game before. During the promotional cycle for the game, Sakurai is quoted as saying, I hope you're not expecting too many new fighters. This was in response to the idea of bringing everyone back from the past, the everyone is here promotion. One has to wonder, did they maybe intend to have less newcomers with more detail this time around? What if we didn't get 12 DLC fighters and instead gave everyone more moves, references, and details, really flesh out this feature. It's just a possibility considering the many carryovers that they had, but a possibility I still doubt. Considering the time, money, and resources it would take to develop something that most players didn't even want to use, if you thought the Smash 4 DLC not having custom specials put a stamp on it, Ultimate not getting them either truly sealed the deal. I think the real reason nobody talks about them nowadays is if you thought Nintendo wasn't too big on showcasing them in the Smash 4 days, now it's basically a banned term. Custom moves you ask? Oh, you mean like the Miis? See, you can change the moveset to whatever you want, you can dress them up, it's all right here, buy the Miis, buy the Miis, please buy this Geno costume. Like you don't hear them alluded to much anymore, which is quite a shame as the whole purpose of Spirits, aside from giving an excuse to cut trophies out of the series, was to showcase what fighting more unique characters could be like, and while they definitely did a good job with what they had, for, for the most part, could you imagine the possibilities for spirit battles if we had custom moves to work with too? Imagine if we got different sub weapons for Inkling, it would be such a fitting callback to Splatoon. We already have different clothing looks in Smash, now we could have different main and sub weapon combinations. Give K. Roll his iconic shockwaves from Donkey Kong 64. Give Ridley plasma beams to shoot, there's so many possibilities but so many balancing problems and ultimately so much work. For what? Despite their novelty and limitless possibilities for move combinations spicing up a gameplay style which let's be honest hasn't changed much in over 20 years, it was easier, more lucrative, and ultimately more appreciated by fans to get entirely new fighters as DLC instead. And I can't help but agree. As much as the development hell and lack of competitive balancing are the obvious reasons why we lost custom moves, they aren't the whole story. The real reason Nintendo cut almost 400 moves and so many more ideas on the table for Ultimate is because no matter what we say, in our hearts we love the old, the nostalgia, we really do, but our wallets love the new more. Nostalgia can only intrigue so much, and for a feature that isn't as accessible to the casual fan as let's say a brand new DLC fighter, why would Nintendo ever try this again? I go in depth on the possibilities of new moves for every character in this video which you're gonna want to see to find out what really could have happened if one of Smash's biggest features wasn't removed.